is event-driven ELT. A little bit about me. I'm a principal consultant here at Pragmatic Works. I've been working in the industry for over 20 years. I held, hold a, a Bachelor of Science in Applied Mathematics from Kent State University in Ohio. I'm a frequent presenter at SQL Saturday and other technical conferences. And I also believe in giving back to the community in a non-technical manner. And I'm active on a national level with my fraternity and also locally uh, with uh, scouting DSA. So it's important to me to have you know, both technical knowledge as well as providing back to the community. The goals for this class is we're gonna give you an architectural overview on migrating from your traditional business intelligence load and you know what we've been doing for the past 10 to 15 years. And we're gonna talk about the life of a file and we're going to you know say well how do i function without ssis and then i'm going to provide you an actual live demo of the code in action and give you know i, I want to give thanks to uh delora bardish one of my colleagues here at pragmatic works um she helped with the first part of the presentation and the demo you're going to see is things that i coded and it's important to note that this presentation is built out of our practical experience on with multiple clients at Pragmatic Works on over the past two years. We are working with clients doing this, and we have been doing this for a while. So this is not theoretical or lab-based knowledge. Um, this is actual practical application that we have implemented at our clients. So just a quick review of what the traditional architecture for our business intelligence is. We have a source. We build a set of SSIS packages to extract and load them into tables into a SQL uh, database. Then we have another set of SSIS packages that transform and load it into our structured data store. And then from there, we use analysis services to build out a semantic layer, whether it's a tabular model or a cube, and then we get to see the data. You, know, you could add reporting services in there or Power BI or people going against the SQL database uh, directly using views. Uh, Excel has always been one of the things. This is the traditional data architecture that we've been doing for well over 10 years. So we want to talk about why migrating to Azure. And there are 12 reasons why we would do this. And, and some of the biggest ones are, are highlighted in bold. The cost of running a traditional ETL program, you have to have servers big enough to handle the spikes in the volume. In other words, when I you know, am doing my data warehouse load overnight, I have to make sure that I have enough horsepower to, to actually get the load accomplished, get the indexes rebuilt, and then that capacity basically sits unused until you do it again the next night or the next week or whatever it takes. So migrating to Azure, we have the ability to scale up and scale down. It's instead of buying and paying for hardware to, to deal with your peak load, it's paying for what you use. And so, you know, we, we, we see cost from a perspective of as people move to the cloud, there may be an initial increase in cost, but over time, because we can scale up or scale down according to need, the cost will lessen. 
they have the ability to offset local IT resources. Companies exist throughout the country, throughout the world, may not have local resources that they can hire. By moving to the cloud, by migrating to the cloud, you're opening up your talent pool uh, for more remote workloads. The next piece is really the crux of this whole presentation. It's event-based file ingestion. Instead of our traditional batch, our ETL gets loaded at night, when a file is loaded into the system, it's an event. And we can then immediately ingest the data into our data warehouse. So it provides the ability to start um, getting the velocity of data away from just, well, what did we do yesterday to what did I do last hour? What did I do last minute? So by doing things from an event, we can increase the velocity of data. Unstructured data has moved into the analytics area and you know we want a couple relational data or um, star schema data with unstructured data. And so not all our data lives in the SQL server. So we have to account for that. And the volume of data is growing and growing and growing at an exponential rate. Those large data volumes also refer to the, the cost because as your, your data volumes grow, you can build the type of storage that you need and reduce cost, generally cheaper than it can be done in-house. With the event-based file ingestion and talk to the near real-time requirements, the other aspect is we want to enable the data scientist. This is a growing field, you know, whether it's artificial intelligence or data science. That group of analysis and they, their source is generally raw data. They don't hit a database. They're not going to hit a tabular model. They often want parquet files. So we're going to enable them to get the data in the format they want. The development time to production will make more sense as I go through the slides. Instead of building a set of SSIS packages, we can parameterize our Azure Data Factory and Logic Apps so that they can accept the metadata and you can start having a single data factory process multiple types based upon the metadata that we send in. And that'll, uh, that'll become more evident as I go through. We can support larger audiences. In other words, we're just not dealing with business intelligence. We could deal with the marketing people, especially from unstructured data. You know, they want to see Twitter clicks, Facebook posts, or that other type. We want to enable the data scientists. And we don't always want them to come to IT for that data. So we want to enable the larger audience. Mobile is a huge consideration. Um, you know, the, the, it's, it, the advances that Power BI gives in the mobile arena definitely helps get the data into the hands of the users as they need it. And we want to collaborate. In other words, the data scientist can take the data and build new data sets and do data visualizations that can get then get fed back into the enterprise for to, to enable further and more advanced analysis. And then the last piece is file-based history. You know, we're trying to consider moving, in, in incorporating more than just relational database or Kimball slow changing type two dimensions. If we don't have to go into the database to do that and we can do it from a file, that, that enables more people. So from an Azure perspective, we have the multiple sources, whether they're cloud or on-premise, or we have end users FTPing files to us. We're either gonna push or pull the data from API calls, on-premise uses integration runtimes, 
and we're going to use something called the logic app to actually watch for a file to show up. Then we take all this data, move it to blob storage, and this is we're just going to use that as a temporary space. Azure Functions can watch and traverse file structures, and so you, you start picking the right tool for the piece that you're trying to get. We're just trying to move an event along. Microsoft has made a large investment with Databricks. There's Apache Spark, and you're running your Python data load, your Scala data load, that can now, you know, large compute nodes verifying the versions of your files, generating your Delta files, and then moving that data to your more permanent data store, which in this case would be an Azure Data Lake. And we're not gonna necessarily talk about the data lakes, how they get structured, but this is how we start to enable the data scientist. Then you know, we can take those files and directly ingest them into our SQL database or our Azure SQL data warehouse now using Polybase. We now have a place to add our unstructured data. And you'll see we still have a relational store which can hold your logical model and metadata about the files that you're getting. We still expect a semantic layer. And that semantic layer is, you know, is still an Azure analysis services building out that tabular model or as Microsoft progresses directly into Power BI. But now we have data science. We can, we can take the unstructured data and we have the artificial intelligence and all the machine learning tools in whichever form they need. So let's compare the traditional approach to the Azure data um, architecture. On the bottom, you'll see where we have the traditional SSIS, SQL database, SSIS, moving all the way through Power BI. And you'll see that there's some areas that aren't covered by the traditional approach. This is where the Azure adds the value. Adding in that Databricks component, very powerful stuff. It doesn't just require you know, a DBA or a SQL programmer, but now you're enabling more people to get at the data. Um, your, your Scala, using Python, whatever you need starts getting into the, into the Databricks. Building out that data store in Azure Data Lake is your more permanent and standardized data store. And building out the unstructured data. The unstructured data could all, is also going to include some of our log information. In this case, using Azure, um, using Microsoft's Cosmo DB, which is at the end of the day a document database, can also be configured as a graph type database. But we're enabling the data science. So now we're going to talk about the life of a file. We're going to talk about using Azure Data Factory as an orchestrator, how we listen for new files using logic apps. We want to then pre-process in a blob storage, build the current and historical files in Data Lake, and then ingest your data into your Azure Data Warehouse. The, think of the data as what you're moving. Think of it as the data is available as the event, and we're going to start passing the events along. Logic apps are just web calls, and I'll show you those in detail in the demo. In this case, we have, you know, the source, say, clients in the field or agencies pushing data, uploading data to an SFTP site. So I have a logic app that sits and watches for a file to exist. It then copies it into the raw storage. Then those logic apps call a different logic app. 
and generally we're logging the metadata so we want to know when the events happen we'll log every event you'll see that as a common theme we so we're calling store procedures in in azure sql db we have other logic events that get called then those logic events will call an azure data factory pipeline which then actually does the data movement, copies it to the blob storage, records the event. The event, it becomes unstructured data. It's just a JSON document that gets held in Cosmo DB. We can do a scheduled pull from a source that represents a, a more traditional batch style. You know, a lot of times these are still in dealing with the on-premise or you know there's a timing issue azure logic apps or data factory pipelines can be triggered on a recurrence basis so here again we have a logic app watching for things to get copied into the blob storage get the metadata or record the event use azure data factory to do the heavy lifting azure data factory calls logic apps that then records events and we move the file along because this can be metadata driven it's not a single ssis package for each file type but we keep the file type in metadata and pass it into the data factory here's a more complicated example using salesforce um, watching for that blob storage Azure Data Factory makes the connection, stages the data into another blob storage container, and records its event in SQL Server. And then in this case, we're showing HD Insight, but that has been more, a, a more modern approach is using Databricks. So imagine shifting this out for Databricks. It cleanses the CSV file, moves it to blob storage, um, and I've done this to convert Excel files into comma delimited CSV files, quoted uh, CSV files. Azure Functions then watching the blob storage because they can traverse through directories. It calls another logic app. The logic app records its event. And we start seeing this pattern develop, you know, logic apps calling data factories, determining what to do recording the events in a document database and then pushing to the permanent storage for the data lake. Similarly, we can pull from a source. If we don't need to do any of the pre-processing and you see the same pattern start to, de start to develop. So it becomes the regardless of the ingestion method copy it to blob storage, have an Azure function, call a logic app, record the event. If it's something we, if the event needs to happen, then we pull to the logic app, logic app calls the data factory, data factories can call Databricks, or in this case, HD Insight, and the data moves along. All sources start following this, regardless of what happens to the blob storage or how it gets into the raw storage. The pattern, again, continues. Now we're showing you with the data bricks. One orchestration for, one orchestration pipeline for all sources. All pipelines will log their metadata. We're dealing with events here. And so we want to record each event and know whether it succeeded or failed, or whether it started. So you'll see a common logic app across the environment for when an access gets called or when a log and when failure gets added. In this case, event hubs, and then I'm quickly becoming a fan of using an event hub in all cases because logic apps are web apps and they're web, are micro apps in their own right. You know, they come with their own address. If I start writing to an event hub, 
I have I can always write to the same spot. And then that event hub can push out the event payload into a Cosmos DB. But from an ingestion standpoint, you have Azure Blob, the raw storage, or the temporary storage in raw format in Blob. We find an ingestion pipeline, and then it determines what to do with the file. Either it's new data, just change file, or it's deleted files, pushes it into other data factory pipelines, and then ingests it into the data lake store as an as-is file. For all sources. And you start that you start seeing that the pattern develops. Our enterprise data store, whether it's in third normal form or it's converted into an uh, OLAP, either Kimball or Inman model. But we still have the Azure Data Warehouse, we still have SQL DB. From the Data Lake store, from that permanent structure, this is the second half, gets it loaded into your Data Warehouse or your tables, always recording the event. This can be done in parallel as well. So the tools that we're going to use to do this, the Azure Logic Apps, these are micro apps. I want a single app to do one thing well, or a small set of things well. They're gonna watch the FTP site for when a file gets added or modified. We're gonna event log the events. We want to move data from blob storage to the data lake or have it be deleted. Any notifications, emails, emails work well this way. And then loading data into the Cosmo DB. Azure Functions, again, think micro apps. They want to do one thing well. And in this case, the logic, the Azure function is going to watch blob storage and it's it, because it can traverse files and logic apps can't, I have to pick the right tool for the right function. The Azure Event Hub will handle the events and as, it, as the events happen, other logic events can watch that event queue and when their event shows up, then they can act upon it. Remember, this is event-driven ELT. Our blob storage is our temporary workspace. Our Azure Data Factory is where the heavy lifting is going to happen and process our orchestration, actually do the copy, and the QA methodologies. We can implement some QA metrics because of the outputs of the Azure Data Factory components that we can now enable QA as part of the data load. Databricks, this is where we can do a lot of heavy lifting for uh, the data processing and especially from the file based. Again, it's not SQL proprietary, it's dealing more with the, uh, with the um, Apache Spark. The, the team, one of our teams originally was doing HD Insight, but found that as the tools increased, the Databricks made more sense. The Azure Data Lake holds the data files, and this is our permanent data store. You know, we always want to know where we were, can, or, or where our current data as is files, but this is also where we enable data science. So Databricks can take that file that we've been giving at, given as it ingests into um, uh, say a SQL repository, it can also build out the Parquet files that provides that data science self-service. Power BI can also go into the data lake and it becomes a source. So we're doing that, we're, we're building out more and more people, we're building out that collaboration, we're broadening the audience. The Cosmo DB uh, in this situation is for logging, and then we use Azure Key Vaults to build out a development, a QA, and a production migration. Because we're dealing with URLs, we can 
the Azure Key Vault helps parameterize the logic apps and data factory, so those security mechanisms don't have to get recoded or the connection information doesn't have to get replaced when you want to move through the software development life cycle. Uh, this is key. All of this that I've just showed you is, you know, is based upon a large global company and supporting their global workload. Some of the other tools that we're going to use, again, keeping SQL database and the metadata, your data warehouse, uh, whether it's an Inman or a Kimball or Kimball-esque hybrid, let's say a consumption-based architecture, you know, we we still want to adhere to some of the, you know, good design concepts uh, because it helps get your data to be usable. Azure Analysis Services is going to become our semantic layer and Power BI is where we're going to do our reporting and our self-service. And as Microsoft moves forward, though, you know, their Power BI is increasing in its semantic layer abilities as well. And that's one of the one of the overall points on dealing with all of the cloud tools. And this is a key differentiator between Azure and the on-premise. If I had to maintain and administer all of these tools or their equivalent on an on-premise basis, I'm constantly upgrading and patching these tools. If I'm doing it in the cloud, that upgrading and patching and everything is done for you. You're getting the latest and greatest as it gets developed. A lot of times as we're developing, even sometimes as we're doing the presentations, and you see other people do presentations on the cloud, you'll hear a common phrase, well, that wasn't here yesterday, or the last time I did that, we didn't have that functionality, so now we do. So it's that constantly increasing um, functionality in the cloud tools that doesn't just increase the velocity of your data, but it incre can increase the velocity of your development and your development capabilities. We want to maintain good software development lifecycle aspects, so all of this can be managed code. The Python projects, our Azure Data Warehouse, Logic Apps, they're all based upon JSON. And we build Visual Studio projects. This, this slide says Team Foundation Server for the source code. That's already changed at the beginning of this month, probably a week or so ago. You won't hear Team Foundation Server or TFS again. It's all now Azure DevOps. So we're getting the developers, whether they're DBAs or whether they're web developers, everybody's coming to a common development environment, and that enables more people as well. With that, I'm going to kick into the demo, and we're going to see this live in action. This is my Azure portal, and I have a resource group for event-driven ELT. We're going to see that I have logic apps. I'll go by type. Our API connections, this is all web-based, it's in the cloud, so everything talks through an API connection whether it's the blob storage, the data factory, our O365 connection, our SQL connection, we see we have our data factory, our logic apps for our common event handles, then our logic app that is actually gonna get the file, and then we see we have our SQL server and our SQL database, and then ultimately our storage account. as I bring up the Storage Explorer, which I should have done prior. We 
Well, the storage explorer shows up. There it is. The data that we're dealing with is some aircraft data. This is uh, readily available from the FAA. We have aircraft files, um, the deep dealers types of engines they have, and then I actually have my flight data. So this represents a data load uh, or, or into a staging. So these are the this is the raw data that we're going to process in our blob storage. I'm going to first take a look at our common error routines and our, our common logic gaps. In this case, every we're dealing with web. It's an HTTP call. This is the URL for this logic app. That URL is generated um, when I create the logic app. It is different if I went through dev QA and production. These type of URLs is something that we would put in, in key vaults. A message is received and we look at the content of that JSON that gets passed around. This is where we had an error. We're passing out from a data factory. We want to know where it came from, what the message was. I want to copy the file and that was you know the file that had the error into our archive area. And then we want to delete the file that was an error because we moved it to where it went. But then we record, we want to insert into our operations event log. Again, we're calling store procedures. I want to send an email. This is a micro app that just deals with what happens when an error event happens, regardless of where it comes from. Similarly, the common success routine. is a web call. You'll see that it is a different URL. Here again, we parse the payload from the um, from the web post. It's just a just a JSON document. We're copying from our to load into our archive because we were able to get that changed. We remove out of our temporary storage. And again, in this case, we're recording success. We're sending a success email. All of this is parameterized with JSON functions. Because we're passing around file names. We can even take a look at it from a code view. It has our connection information tells us what we're going to call, where the parameters are coming from. All of this is done in JSON. Let's go ahead and take a look at the get file. This is an example where we're watching for a file to be added or modified. In this case, I'm only going to do one file at a time, but this is going to run every 15 seconds. It records the event and says, hey, I found a file. Now I got to do something with the file. In this case, if the file is type of aircraft reference, then I'm going to call a data factory pipeline with that file name. 
Well, if it wasn't an aircraft reference, it's probably, it, and it, in this case, it's one of our flight date, our, our flight facts. So we know that the file name contains the word flight. If it does, then we call another data factory and we call the load the flight. Here we're loading a reference, here we're loading a flight. If I don't, if I don't know what to do, I have something called a, a stub pipeline. I always want to do something. So the stub pipeline, I'll show you that in a second. The stub pipeline just really calls the error routine and says, hey, I got a file. I didn't know what to do with it. So let's shift over and look at Azure Data Factory. Here I have connection information already built for our blob storage and for our SQL tables that we're gonna stage the data into. The SQL table pulls its schema information from the database. Similarly, the schema is done for the flight and you'll see here, I'll show you from the blob. Because we don't know the file name, this pipeline doesn't know the file name, we pass in to the pipeline the file. So you'll see where we call a data factory pipeline, we're passing in that file name. This is the essence of event driven. I have a file, what do I do with it while I'm processing it? This has a standard structure. This, so we're using it. This can be parameterized, held as a in as metadata and passed in, so we could have a single orchestrator. But in this case, we're just going to show you the simple version. We're passing in the flight, similar with the flight source, uh, the fax source. Again, we have the schema already built. These are the data sets. talked about the stub pipeline. You'll see that for the overall pipeline, it's expecting to get a source file name. That's, you know, the event, we have a file. So what file did we get? This is the file. We're going to call a SQL stored procedure. Same one that's called from our logic app, insert the operations event log and pass in the parameters that we need. And then I call that common error routine, passing the payload of the information that I want to see. We have the simple example of the reference. Same parameter, everything is passing a file name. Call the same store procedure providing the more information. If the store procedure doesn't happen, call the error processor. We recorded the event. Now we call, we, we do the copy task. We're using Azure Data Factory to do the heavy lifting. We see our source is that dynamic file that we pushed through. This is the file name, the sync, in this case is just the table and we do the mapping. Old school under the hoods, what we're doing is building um, BCP, old bulk call B protocol, protocol format files. So if you get errors here and you see format file errors, that's why this is some old school stuff, but it does the mapping. Then it either passes the event, hey, I succeeded or I failed. The more complex example is our flight. You know, this is our, our, our fact data. Same file name parameter, hit the same thing. Now I want to ingest or add some data into the, into the fact table, into the data flow. It's not a straight one-to-one -one copy 
column A to column B, I have more columns. Source is still that dynamic file name, but in this case, I'm loading through a stored procedure because I want to add the file name to the row of the data. So we have to call a stored procedure using a uh, SQL user-defined table type, and we're doing it through a stored procedure. Mapping then is done in a similar manner, and we call common, and then we call error. This shows at each level what is getting ready to happen. So what we're going to do is that we're actually going to do this live. Don't want to move this big one. So this is my raw data. I'm going to copy it into where I have my I clicked too many times, I wasn't patient. I'm gonna to paste to where my logic app is watching in my two load directory. One is, so now we've generated a handful of events in parallel. If I refresh, I start seeing my logic app picked up the events. And we can actually go in and see what that logic app did. We see that it picked up engine text. Wasn't the aircraft load? It wasn't a flight. We didn't know what to do with it, so we called the stub pipeline. So we see that this was a micro event. It just, it just happened. So all of those events happen. Let's go take a look at the Azure Data Factory and see what's actually running out there in the past 24 hours. We see the stub pipeline already executed. This is our flight data, our fact data. Let's take a look at one that's in process. We'll see that it already recorded. It's in progress here. We're gonna watch as these as these finish up, you can see that our logic apps are starting to send out those email messages because the event happened and we know engine text got called the stub pipeline. We didn't know what to do with dealers. We see as the events process, we get the information loaded. So this is more immediate. We've increased the velocity of getting the data into the hands of our end users. We still have a couple of our flights, a couple of our fact data still getting added in there. And now our entire workload has completed. And here is our last, whoops, here's our last three emails. So let's actually look into the database. And I was gonna truncate these. We see that our events got recorded. file was found, 
pipelines were started. And you can start doing analytics on the events as well. Again, you know, for what I was showing you in the first half of the uh, presentation, these entries can just as easily get pushed out into JSON objects that are held in your document database you know, for analysis at a later view. But here we're just pushing all the events into just the SQL table. And you can see where the errors are so you, you can get some better operational log. You see where the data for the aircraft came in. You see where we in included the name of the file into the staging of the, um, the fact data. And you can see since we did it in parallel that for the 4th of December, the 5th of December, that you know it is an important that everything get loaded, you know, sequentially basis. This was a parallel data load. So the parallelism that, that, that we're invoking helps a lot too. And once the data is staged, then you can, you know, transform it as needed. The last part that I want to show you is that in the raw storage, we maintained our raw storage. All the files got moved. We want to we want to keep all of our source files in 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 what could be in a data lake, but you know we added the UTC time. That was part of a logic app that just appended the UTC time onto the file. And you can see you know when it was modified. Here's the ones we just did. So we're keeping that record so that we can rebuild the data warehouse if needed. Oh, I yeah, the error the error ones, you know, like engine should have gone to error, but that's a issue with my logic app. I just didn't change the directory. So just knowing the fact that we're moving the data to where it needs to go. So I know we've got about five minutes left. I don't know if we can necessarily uh, field any questions. Crystal, is there questions that can, the, uh, is there a question I can answer? Um, let me see, let me jump in here really quickly and see if there's any questions. I don't see any questions in here. Okay. Um, so I asked, do you have this info detailed on your blog post or can you, or like, can you put it on there? Um, I'll work with, I'll work with you, Crystal, and see what we can put out there. Okay, not a problem. And we can see if we can um, um, get some of the info, like you guys will also receive the recording tomorrow um, in your email. So if you guys are looking just to have some extra information on it, or if we'll, I'll see if we can, Michael, if we can put your um, blog into the email that goes out to you guys tomorrow as well. Um, uh, there's some more questions coming in here. Someone, yes, the session will be shared with you guys um, tomorrow. Um, they're also on YouTube. If you guys, for any other reason, don't receive the link, um, they're also all of our webinars on YouTube, past and present. So please look for that. Um, and then, let's see. Um, okay, hold on. This is quite, quite a bit coming in. Uh, excellent. What would you learn first expose yourself to data, factory, V2, Python, or Spark? I, the <laughs> here's the consulting answer. It depends. It depends on what you need to do. Um, 
they, first of all, you'd be probably starting with your Azure Data Factory V2, because from there, if Databricks, you know, is something that needs to happen, Azure Data Factory can call Databricks notebooks. However, if you're not necessarily, you know, dealing with Azure Data Factory and your workload is more based upon what Databricks can provide for you, then you would be looking at the Python or the Spark or, or the Scala. So it depends on, on your perspective and the workload that you need to enable. But the, the commonality is that dealing with logic apps and Azure Data Factory and the Azure tools, you know, it, it helps build that orchestration out. So I guess I'd start with the Azure Data Factory, but you need to choose the right tool. And that's one of my Azure Everyday blogs is choosing the right tool for your ELT workload. We have in the cloud of many tools. It's not just one tool anymore. It's about picking the right tool for the right job. So probably if you're gonna start somewhere, Azure Data Factory would be the better place to start. Any other questions? So then a little bit more about Pragmatic Works. You know, we're the people out in the field doing this stuff on a daily basis. Like I said, the presentation I gave you is not theoretical or lab-based. It's based upon real world clients that are doing this, you know, on a local or on a global basis. But Pragmatic Works offers also delivery of their training, either in boot camps, workshops. We have a series of on-demand training. New for 2019, even though we're halfway through 2019, we're offering Power BI managed services. And as people pick up their Power BI um, workloads, and as Microsoft makes more investment in Power BI, and as Gartner agrees that Power BI is, is starting to outpace all other tools in the market. We can provide, we can help manage your Power BI um, resources, provide the user support, your management, help you plan and configure and you, uh, report utilization, and we can also monitor your system, help validate your investment in Power BI. That's all I have. I very much appreciate everybody attending today. Please look us up and uh, give us a call and help us engage you, get, get into the modern data movement and uh, modern data warehousing techniques. Thank you all. Have a good day. Thanks, Michael. Um, you do have a few more questions coming in. Do you want to try to hit a couple of more or do you want to sure. maybe no, answer? No, I got No, no, I can. I'll, you just have a couple of more here. Um, there's a question that says, uh, will you be sharing the code for Logic Apps ADF? I, am, I haven't made that decision yet. I've been asked for it in the SQL Saturday. Uh, I, I, I have yet to determine that. Okay. Um, is, there, is, this, is this pattern code available on the web anywhere? Well, that's an interesting question. There's not a lot of documentation out there. The stuff changes too fast. So uh, e even in developing it, you know, there's a lot of times there, is, there, there isn't documentation or the documentation isn't up to date. So uh, unfortunately, the answer is not really. It, it's just our experience and how we've been putting it together for our clients. The individual components have documentation. And you know that part, you know, we rely on heavily. But how it all kind of fits together is, you know, a lot of it comes through experience. Um. Okay. Um. Let's see. I think that's the last one. Is the pattern code available anywhere? And yep, I think that's the last one. I think you answered the last one. 
Okay. All right, perfect. Thank you, Michael, again for hosting this webinar. We really appreciate it. And as for everybody else, like I was saying, we will have the recording up on YouTube as well as it will be emailed to you tomorrow. Um, so if you guys have any questions until then or after then, please feel free to reach out to myself or Michael. Um, I will try to include his blog into um, the email that that will be sent with the webinar link tomorrow. So, um, yeah. So thank you guys for joining and we really appreciate it. And like I said, you guys will receive the email link tomorrow. Michael, again, thank you so much for hosting. And we, I hope you guys all have a wonderful day. Thank you all.